I'm going to talk about various aspects of transactional memory, uh, what it is, uh, why you might want it, and how to use it. Now, everyone knows that you cannot give a computer science talk without mentioning Moore's Law at least once. So I'm going to discharge that obligation with my first slide. Now, I think everyone knows this, but I think it's still worth uh, pointing out that Moore's Law says that uh, up until recently, uh, the transistor, the transistors got smaller and smaller. For a long time, that also meant that the clock speed uh, would uh, go up, but that's no longer the case. Uh, transistors are still, for the time being, being smaller and smaller. You can still fit more and more transistors onto a uh, square millimeter. Uh, that may not be true for long, but it's still true today. But clock speeds haven't gone up. And the reason for this is uh, very simple. Uh, that's because the, <clears throat> when the transistors get too small, they overheat. And if you don't want your laptop to catch on fire, you can't make it run any faster. So instead of making things run faster, uh, what engineers have done is they've made the uh, uh, processors more and more concurrent. So you have the same clock speed more or less every year, but you get more and more users to work with. Now, a long time ago, uh, a computer consisted of a single CPU and uh, memory. And today, uh, there are very few of these architectures left because it is so cheap to put multiple chips, multiple uh, processors on a chip. Your toaster probably has uh, multiple processors. Uh, after people discovered concurrency, they built uh, things called shared memory multiprocessors, which even though the slide says endangered, they don't really exist anymore uh, either. So today's processors are what are called multi-core uh, processors, uh, sometimes called CMP. Uh, and that means that the processors cache, um, at least some of the memory, the communication um, process, uh, communication medium are all put together on a single uh, piece of uh, silicon. So in real life, uh, this is this is what a uh, rather small scale, old fashioned uh, multi core looks like. Each of those uh, rectangles is a processor. Everything else is uh, uh, consists of caches and uh, memory. So the processors and memory are all, are all on the same uh, chip. Now. This has implications for software, which is what we really care about. This isn't a uh, lecture so much on hardware. It's really about how to write uh, programs. Now, in the old days, a uh, long time before, you know, I suspect some of you were born, uh, there was something called the free ride of software. That is, you could leave the code the same, and your uniprocessor would get faster and faster. Uh, the picture shows it getting bigger to indicate that it's stronger, when of course it actually got smaller, but I'm sure you can um, understand that. Now, in a, an ideal world, what would happen is every year, you could make your program more concurrent and the people who build chips would build more highly concurrent processors and your code would speed up. Now, of course, life is not uh, that uh, simple. In fact, uh, this doesn't uh, happen for a number of reasons. But what we really see happening is something that looks more like this. That is, we build multiple, uh, we build software, we put in, we make it parallel, we make it concurrent, uh, we add threads, we add locks, we add synchronization. And even though the hardware looks like it's much more powerful and parallel, in fact, the software can't keep up. 
the uh, locks cause congestion, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, problems. So what all of this is leading up to is the observation, which uh, may be obvious, but I think it's still worth uh, dwelling on, that exploiting parallelism is hard. It requires uh, expertise and it requires careful thinking. Again, in the old days, you could write your software and sit back and a faster uh, clock speed would make it run faster and uh, everyone uh, would be uh, happy and make uh, more money. Today, those uh, ideal days are uh, long gone. So after Moore's law, uh, there was Amdahl's law. So Amdahl's law tells us how to think about parallelism. Now, of course, Amdahl's law is uh, an idealization and abstraction, and you shouldn't really take it literally, but it does give us a way to approach the problem of how to make software scale with increased parallelism. So let's define the speed up of a program as the ratio between the amount of time it would take on a single processor and the amount of time that same program takes on an n-threaded execution, n-threaded machine. So as n gets larger, we would like things to speed up. And what we really care about is how much does this speed up? So specifically, Amdahl's law uh, looks like uh, this. So here, the p is a fraction of your code that can be parallelized. For example, if your code is entirely sequential, then p is 0 and um, you're wasting your money on a multi-core. If P is one, then everything is embarrassingly parallel. But in most of the applications that we care about, uh, this uh, P is somewhere between zero and one. So let's look at what this uh, equation says. So we take the parallel fraction and we divide it by the number of threads. So that's the amount of time the parallel part it takes. The sequential part is, uh, actually, I think that should be a one uh, minus B uh, there. But the, the parallel part can't be sped up. The Sorry, the sequential part cannot be sped up. The parallel part can be. And so your speed up is uh, given in an idealized sense by this equation. Of course, in real life, there are other issues like uh, you know, cache locality and, uh, and so on that affect your actual speed. But this is a good approximation for our purposes. Now, um, my favorite way of understanding the meaning of Amdahl's law, uh, aside from the uh, mathematics, is something like this. So in practice, Amdahl's law says that a little bit of bad synchronization will ruin everything. That it turns out if you want to exploit modern hardware, modern multi-core uh, hardware, you need to think very hard about synchronization because that is what controls how well your application will scale in the uh, modern uh, world. So let's run through a few examples. Uh, just to um, see what's going on. So let's say uh, you go out and you buy a 10-core machine. Of course, 10 cores is not so much these days, but uh, it's a nice round number. And your application is 60% concurrent and 40% sequential. So in other words, 60% of it can be distributed among the concurrent processors among the concurrent uh, cores, and 40% of it is, uh, you know, user interface, um, you know, disk, uh, the kind of thing that uh, cannot be sped up. So how much of a speed up will Amdahl's law give you? In other words, when you told your boss you wanted to buy a 10-core machine, your boss said, well, I hope we see a 10-fold speed up in our application. How close do you get with 60% concurrent and 40% sequential? Well, the answer is um, basically you get a twofold speed up. 
So you bought 10 processors, uh, but you get a twofold uh, speed up. So this is um, not very encouraging. So <clears throat> to deal with that, you pick your programmers and you force them to work on the evenings and weekends to uh, reduce the sequential part and increase the concurrent part. And after a lot of uh, work, they come up with something that is now 80% concurrent and 20% sequential. And so you run your experiments to see how fast, how close you get to a tenfold speed up. And now it's basically three and a half. So you worked very hard. Your 80% of your code is concurrent. And, uh, but you're only getting uh, a uh, three and a half fold uh, speed up. Again, this is a very tough uh, kind of uh, world to uh, live in. So you go back and you work even harder. You go up to 90% concurrent. And <clears throat> at 90% concurrent, you get basically a five fold speed up. So that says that in some sense, although you have 10 processors, you're only getting the benefit of uh, five. If you really want to get a speed up that looks anything like your hardware, you need to make your application 99% concurrent and 1% sequential. And now you're getting close to a, a tenfold uh, speed up. So what that says is that um, Amdahl's law is, uh, is a harsh uh, reality. It says that you cannot simply take your code, write it uh, any old way you want, and then expect to uh, benefit from increases in the hardware. If your code is too sequential, then it doesn't matter how hard the in engineers at Intel and so on uh, work, uh, because you're not going to be able to exploit uh, that, uh, those improvements. So what I want to talk about here is not how to take a program and break it up into parallel parts. Uh, I want to talk about how to take the parts that are hard to make concurrent and make them concurrent. Uh, because we've seen that uh, making parts of your code concurrent can have a big influence on speed up and scalability. The obvious analogy is uh, the ball bearings on a bicycle. You can go out and uh, buy an Italian racing bicycles with composite uh, parts. Uh, but the, in the end, the thing that matters most are the ball bearings, the places where the parts have to move together. And concurrency is really the ball bearings of uh, software. That's the part uh, that uh, if it isn't done right, uh, nothing else will really matter that much. So let's talk about different ways of doing synchronization. Now, the traditional way to do synchronization is if you have a data structure that's shared by multiple cores, those little chip things you can think of as being uh, uh, concurrent uh, cores, uh, you put a lock on the data structure, the same way you would put a lock on a bathroom. This ensures that only one thread can be operating on the object at, the same, at a particular time, because if two of them are operating in an unsynchronized way, then uh, confusion can uh, result. Now, uh, putting one lock on a data structure is uh, cumbersome. Uh, if you've ever had a, a small child in your house, uh, sooner or later they will um, wander into the bathroom when you're not looking and lock themselves inside. And it takes a long time to, uh, to get them out. So a straightforward way to fix this is to say, well, Putting a single lock on everything is uh, too coarse-grained. It's too crude. Uh, what we want is to say, well, we have some complex data structure. Why don't you just lock the parts that you need? Ah, so the um, 
Before I get into this, I should say that the big advantage of coarse grain locks is it's easy, relatively easy to make them correct. If you put one big lock on your entire file system, on your entire database, then you have pretty much reduced the problem to sequential programming. And even though sequential programming is also hard, we kind of know how to do that. But it has very poor performance. So the obvious thing to say is, well, we can lock the parts that we need and we'll do fine grain locking. That is, we'll put a lock on each piece of the data structure. And as you diverse the data structure, you acquire the lock you need. And then when you're done, you release the lock and you make sure that in this way, you can guarantee that multiple threads can use the data structure at the same time. Now, as anyone who tried this knows, uh, this can be very tricky. Uh, it can be very hard to write uh, data structures uh, based on fine grained locking. Uh, you can publish papers on how to uh, do this. If you can publish papers on how to do something, then it's not really a, um, a very good engineering technique. Now, locks have other problems besides the problem of guaranteeing correctness. For example, uh, locks are not fault tolerant. If one thread acquires a lock and then it takes a page fault, while it's holding the lock, it's uh, waiting for a page to come in, uh, locks are not uh, fault tolerant. If a thread uh, locks, acquires a lock and then uh, has, divides by zero while it's holding the lock, then uh, no one else can use the uh, data structure. Now, people have developed uh, extremely complex and sophisticated ways of saying, well, if you acquire a, a lock and you don't uh, release it, then we have uh, some emergency way of uh, acquiring the lock and cleaning up. Um, these things tend not to work very well and they're complicated and uh, slow. So again, if a uh, thread holding a lock is delayed, then no one else can make progress. So these are um, extremely um, not robust uh, approaches. Now, there's another problem with locks, which is not talked about very much, but I think is uh, very serious. <clears throat> and that is that locking re relies on conventions. Uh, for the most part, uh, programmers need to follow protocols and conventions and have understandings in order to use locks uh, correctly. In particular, the relation between the um, lock data and the object data, uh, what it means, what a lock is just a bit or a byte in memory. An object can be a complicated pointer based uh, data structure or part of a complicated data structure. The relationship between that lock and the data uh, basically exists only in the mind of the programmer. Now, I know that programming languages have introduced uh, many mechanisms for associating locks with objects, you know, monitors, uh, you know, Java and so on. But uh, these have never really been successful when you try to do uh, very sophisticated locks. Uh, as a case in point, uh, here is a comment from the Linux uh, kernel. And uh, I won't uh, try to uh, read this to you, but uh, I don't really understand what this means either. Uh, if I were working on a project where I needed to use this uh, particular uh, synchronized buffer correctly, I would be very worried because I don't know who wrote this. I'm not entirely sure what this means. I don't know if it's still correct. Uh, but this is uh, basically how locks work in uh, complicated uh, systems. Uh, programmers uh, leave uh, comments, uh, kind of like graffiti, uh, saying, uh, here's how to use something. Uh, bad things will happen if you don't, uh, but often bad things happen anyway. Now, another um problem that people have with locks and again this is hard to make formal but i think we all know it when we see it 
And that is that locks make simple problems hard. So let me give you a very simple problem that uh, you could explain to a high school student. Let's say we have a double-ended queue. That is, we have a, a queue where you can NQ or DQ at either end. So one thread can NQ at one end, another thread can NQ at the other end. You could also uh, DQ at uh, various uh, sides. Now, your job is to do lock-based synchronization for this. Now, the rule is that uh, if the ends of the queue are far apart, then you should be able to work on both ends without interference because they don't affect one another. If I'm working at one end of a uh, long double-ended queue and you're working at the other end of the long double-ended queue, then there's no reason we need to coordinate. However, if the queue is uh, small, for example, there's only one element in the queue and uh, you and I uh, both try to grab it at the same time, then we do need synchronization. So we have something where the kind of synchronization that we want is, um, depends on the state of the uh, queue. And this is a simple problem, which is easy to explain, but it's actually very hard to do. And <clears throat> the truth is that if you came up with a novel solution, you could probably publish this in a technical conference. And uh, I know this because uh, as far as I know, the first um, technical uh, solution uh, was published by uh, Magid Michael and uh, Michael uh, Scott uh, in uh, Podsy 97. And it's a, a nice uh, uh, result, but it's still a, um, I think is a problem that a pro is a problem for the discipline if a simple to state problem is so is actually so hard that it's a publishable result to uh, solve it. Now, uh, our friends, the mathematicians, uh, love this sort of thing. You know, they number theorists come up with very simple conjectures that take centuries to solve. But computer science is supposed to be an engineering discipline. We're supposed to solve problems, not uh, uh, celebrate unsolved uh, problems. And I think there's something wrong with uh, this whole notion of locking if you can get publishable results by solving simple uh, problems. Okay, so um, I'll give you another um, uh, more or less final problem with uh, locks, and that is you cannot compose locks. So the first thing you learn as a programmer is that you do not have to write your own sine and cosine uh, routines because we have libraries. Any time in a program I need to compute the sine of an angle, I can call a numeric library, which will give me a correct numerically stable answer. I don't need to know how that works. I don't need to know about Taylor series. I don't need to know about numerical instability. I call it, it was written by experts, and I don't have to think about it. For locks, uh, the situation is uh, much uh, worse. So here, for example, I have a, a thread that uh, wants to transfer something from one queue to the other. And what I want to make sure is that this transfer is atomic. And atomic in the sense that uh, no other thread sees two copies of the transferred item. No other thread sees that the item is missing. Every concurrent observer sees that the item is either in one queue or the other queue. And so the question is, how do we do that uh, with locks? Well, kind of an obvious way to do this is you lock the source. Then you lock the target. Then you do the transfer. Then you unlock, unlock uh, then you release the locks. So this is how, for example, uh, two-phase locking in databases uh, work. Now, but think about how, what are the implications of this for software structure? Well, it says that the NQ and DQ methods cannot provide internal synchronization. You can't make this a Java synchronized uh, method. 
because the method will acquire the lock, perform the operation, and release the lock. But the only way to do an atomic transfer is to hold the lock uh, while the transfer is going on. So what that says is that the only way to compose these accus is the objects have to expose their locking protocols to the client. Your FIFO queue has to have a lock and unlock operation that can be called uh, by, by clients. But this means that you need to trust your clients to devise and follow the protocols. If you do all your synchronization inside a method, then you can guarantee that your method is correct. But if you say, here is a queue, it only behaves correctly if your clients follow the protocol, uh, that's a uh, very poor uh, situation from the point of view of uh, software engineering. So it really says that um, you have to trust everyone to uh, behave themselves. And if anybody malfunctions, then even if you're behaving correctly, you may suffer. Uh, another problem with um, Another common synchronization problem is uh, monitor, wait, and signal. Here the problem is we have a thread that's waiting for an arrive, maybe a message buffer. The buffer is empty, so the process is I'm going to go to sleep. There's no reason for me to use resources when there's nothing to do. I'm going to go to sleep, notify me when something shows up. So then when an item shows up in the buffer, we can wake up the um, thread and the, and the thread can consume things. So the monitor wait and signal problem is you say if the buffer is empty, wait for the item to show up, put me to sleep so I'm not using valuable resources. Uh, this is a um, classical synchronization problem. Now the problem that concerns me is that this, this pattern of uh, monitor wait and signal does not compose. So here we have a thread that is willing to wait for something to show up in either of two buffers. So the thread says, well, the first buffer is empty. I'm going to check the second buffer. The second buffer is empty now. So the part thread says, I'm going to go to sleep and I want to wait for either one. Now the problem is that this is impossible to program using classical monitors. If you do this in a Java class, then once you acquire the monitor lock, you see the buffer is empty, you have to go to sleep inside the uh, monitor. You can't say, I'm going to go to sleep inside the monitor and yet be active in another monitor. So even very simple forms of composition don't uh, work in the classical synchronization uh, constructs. Now these were fine you know, back in Dijkstra's day when people were looking at small problems, but this is not a very good way to design scalable modern uh, software. So I'm going to um, propose an alternative to this classical form of uh, synchronization which I will call the transactional manifesto. Now, it's, there is a, I think everyone knows that uh, a lot of concurrent programming practice is inadequate for the, uh, for the multi-core world. And instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to propose uh, something that focuses on what are called atomic transactions. Now, atomic transactions are not at all a new idea. It's a kind of a poorly kept secret in the computer science world that almost all of the important ideas and systems were developed in the database community. Uh, but database people uh, write papers in their own language. They go to their own conferences. They don't talk to people in programming languages or distributed uh, systems. Uh, so that means that if you steal their ideas, they never notice, and uh, people can think you invented it yourself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to steal the notion of an atomic transaction from the database world. Please don't, don't tell them. 
and we're going to see how far we can go with this. So we're going to replace locking with atomic transactions, and we're going to talk about um, how to design languages and libraries and efficient uh, runtimes that use this uh, transactional um, uh, transactional interface. Now, of course, I'm not going to have time to talk about all of these uh, subjects. I'm going to have to uh, focus on a, a narrower agenda, but I think you can see how these things uh, fit together. So we've already talked about uh, what's wrong with locks. So I'm going to say a little bit about uh, transactions versus locks. I'm going to go back and talk about hardware. So I'm going to talk about hardware support for, uh, for atomic transactions, for, to for transactional memory. I'm going to talk about how you can use transactional memory, uh, various um, kinds of combinations. I'm going to uh, talk about some fun things you can do by combining transactions with locks. Now, when I say that atomic transactions can solve many of the problems with locks, I'm not saying that we should eliminate all locks. There are certainly cases where locks make uh, sense. Uh, what I'm going to argue is that there are even cases where combining transactions with locks allows us to do some amazing things that would not be possible with either one. And if time uh, permits, I'll talk about some open questions, uh, research questions, things that I think are, uh, are exciting. So first I'll talk about the, you know, what transactions are and how they differ from locks. So for our purposes, a transaction is just a block of code that we will mark in a um, programming language. Uh, a transaction executes atomically. That is, it appears that everything inside this block of code happens instantaneously. So someone watching the state of the world from the outside the program will see the state before, will see the state after, but will never see a, an intermediate state. Another way to formulate this property is to say that the code is serializable. That is, it appears that everything that happened in transactions happened in a one at a time order. This is something that the database people get uh, very excited about. So it says that uh, if you want to reason about the correctness of your transactions, you don't need to worry about all the different ways they can interleave because they appear to happen uh, one, at a, one at a time. Now, often transactions are done in a speculative way, meaning that they make a number of tentative changes. So they make changes, but they don't make them permanent. If, they, if we want to make them permanent, we say they commit. So we make tentative changes. If everything is OK, we commit the transaction. So committing means that we make the effects of the transaction visible to the world. If a transaction fails, then the transaction, we say the transaction aborts. So there's two possible outcomes of a transaction. The transaction can commit and take effect. It can abort and have no effect. So here, for example, is uh, our trivial uh, examples of atomic blocks. So imagine that we have uh, two threads. Uh, one uh, removes a three from x and adds 3 to y. And we'll say that if we put this, we take, we'll invent an atomic keyword. And we'll say that the code associated with an atomic keyword happens atomically. Then here we have a simple example of how to transfer something from one container to another. This was one of the examples that turns out to be very hard to do in a clean way using locks. Uh, here we have a concurrent thread that basically sets a uh, y to zero. Now, if these were regular unsynchronized blocks, then the concurrent access to y would be considered a data race. If you did this in C++, the effects of your program would be undefined. 
Uh, if you did this in uh, Java, if atomic were synchronized blocks, then it would be uh, defined. So you can think of atomic as a relative of a synchronized block. Now, remember we were talking about how hard it is to implement something like a double-ended queue using locks. So I'm going to show you a kind of idealized methodology for writing these kinds of data structures using a transaction. So here I'm going to write a double-ended queue. And I want to guarantee, again, that if the queue is long, if the queue is large, then two threads can operate on different ends of the queue without interference. So for step one, I'm going to write sequential code. So anyone can write a simple uh, code for a, uh, for a queue. Here you create a, a node for the queue, you change the pointers and link it in. This is standard uh, sequential code. In step two, uh, we go in and we enclose it in an atomic block. So the unsynchronized code uh, isn't going to work because if we have concurrent NQs, then if they interleave in a bad way, then uh, bad things will happen. But if we enclose all of our steps in an atomic block, then uh, I know that all of those four lines will appear to happen instantaneously, will appear to happen atomically, and I don't need to worry about the correctness of my, uh, of my queue. So that says that if you have transactions, then you can write sequential code, you can put the core of your operations inside atomic blocks. The runtime system will figure out uh, what needs to happen and everything is, um, everything works. Now, that's an aspiration, not a, um, uh, not an actual fact. There are still uh, all kinds of uh, difficulties. So it's not that simple. You cannot simply uh, take sequential code and put atomic blocks around it and have it work all the time. It works sometimes, uh, but I'm still going to claim that life is easier with transactions, easier in the sense that your code is easier to write and easier in the sense that your code is more likely to be correct. So it's not this simple. Um, there are all kinds of uh, other problems that I'll mention, like a conditional weights. Uh, you remember our uh, thread that uh, acquired a lock, looked in a buffer and said, there's nothing here, I'm going to release it. I need to explain to you how that works with the transactions. Uh, there are, could be problems with false conflicts. Uh, the transactional runtime system may think that there's a conflict between two operations, but, uh, but there isn't. Uh, there are certainly uh, resource uh, limits. Uh, we'll see that, uh, particularly in hardware transactions that are too big or too slow can, uh, can have problems. But I'm going to claim that all of these uh, problems, and some of them are, are still serious problems that require thought, are better problems to have than the problems that you have with locks. That is, uh, it is still easier to solve your problems with transactions. Transactions are not magical. They will not make your problems go away, but they will let you sleep better at night. I promise. Okay, uh, remember our problem with composition. So here we wanted to do the atomic transfer of one item to another queue. Uh, again, using our idealized form of transactions, this is uh, very simple. This is just, uh, we, we do the sequential transfer and we put an atomic a keyword around it and uh, we allow the transaction system to do synchronization. And in particular, we don't need to export uh, a synchronization. Um, the two queues don't need to export synchronization uh, primitives. Uh, we don't need to uh, worry as much about uh, the uh, clients of the objects following complicated uh, protocols. Uh, conditional weighting, 
Uh, this is a construct that uh, actually is used in the uh, concurrent uh, version of Haskell, uh, which has uh, uh, transactions uh, built into it. The idea here is that I want to do a DQ, but if there's nothing to DQ, I want to go to sleep. So I'm going to introduce a retry, which says that I executed this transaction. I don't like what I saw. So I'm going to say roll back the transaction on just before the uh, call. And then when something changes, wake me up and run again. So this has the same effect as a, a signal and wait inside a monitor, but it is much easier to use and I think uh, much more intuitively uh, clear. There, there are many dangers and pitfalls with monitor weights and uh, the uh, retry um, manages to avoid these. Uh, if we want to compose conditional waiting, then uh, we can introduce an or else uh, construct, which says that I'm going to run my first method. If it retries, it comes back and says, sorry, there's nothing I can do here. Uh, then you can go back and try the second one. And if they both retry, then the entire statement uh, retries. That is, it goes to sleep, it rolls back its, uh, its effects, and it waits until something changes and then re-executes the uh, code. So it appears from the outside is that every time you de do a DQ, there's something there. And I claim that this is much easier to use, much easier to reason about than locking uh, disciplines. So at this point, it looks like I've simply said, well, we have a magical atomic keyword that will solve all your problems for you. Look how easy it is to use, but how does this actually work? So now I'm going to talk about how to implement atomic uh, transactions inside, uh, inside programming languages. So I'm going to start with, at the bottom, I'm going to talk about hardware support for transactional memory. As programmers, you probably don't care that much about hardware, or at least you wish you didn't have to care much about hardware. But the state of concurrent programming is still a fairly immature field, and you can't really write effective programs unless you understand how the hardware works. So hardware transactional memory, uh, there's two um, branches of, a, of uh, processors that support this. Intel uh, from Haswell on has something called uh, TSX extensions. I'm primarily going to talk about that. There is another uh, kind of hardware transactional memory on uh, the power family of uh, processors. I'm not going to have time to talk about that. Uh, Intel is uh, more oriented toward fine grained concurrency. Power is uh, more oriented toward uh, numerical uh, computing. But the basic idea, which I will um, explain you know, in a very brief, uh, high level way, is that you can exploit standard cache coherence for synchronization. So it turns out that modern processors already do a lot of concurrency control because they need to manage caches. And it turns out that <clears throat> they already detect synchronization conflicts and they already invalidate cache copies of data. And the key insight into the hardware transactional memory world is that you can take these standardized protocols that have been around since the last century and make small changes to them. And from this, we can get hardware support for transactions. And this is uh, what lies at the core of uh, the Haswell and uh, Power uh, families of uh, hardware transactional memory. So let me... Uh, yes, okay. So uh, standard cache coherence uh, works in a, um, uh, as follows. We have a, a set of processors. We have random access memory. We have a shared bus that they use to communicate. Uh, we have caches. Uh, the processors, processor loads something. It sends a message out on the bus. The memory responds, sends it the uh, data. 
A second processor uh, does the same thing. Uh, everybody listens to the bus in this case, and the uh, other processor uh, provides the, uh, the data. This is how cache coherence uh, works. The uh, synchronization is required here because if one processor modifies data, then it has to tell everyone else, uh, throw out your copy of the data because I changed it. It's expensive to uh, send the uh, data back to memory, so you hang on to it in the uh, uh, processor, in processor cache. And so the memory tries to participate as little as possible. So hardware transactional memory is almost the same idea. So here, some pro a process starts, it reads the data on behalf of a transaction, and it marks that data in the cache saying, I read this on behalf of a transaction. Uh, the other processor says the same thing. And so both of these are marked as uh, being part of a transaction. At some point, a uh, process decides to commit. So then it simply marks that data as being non-transactional. And uh, then the other uh, uh, process will do the same thing. So here, let's, when you write something, you modify it in the cache. Now let's rewind and talk about what happens when there is a conflict between transactions. So here, both of the processors read the data on behalf of transactions. One processor wrote it. It sends out an invalidation. And the first uh, transaction, the first transaction is aborted because now there is a, a synchronization conflict. So as you can see that we need a few extra bits on the cache lines and a few extra messages, and we can turn standard cache coherence into a, a transactional memory. Uh, the important thing here is that unlike distributed uh, computing, you can commit uh, locally. All you need to do is you mark your tra transactional cache entries as uh, valid and non-transactional. So this is much more efficient than your standard, say, two-phase uh, commit uh, protocol. Okay, and that's really what you need to understand about um, how transactional memory works in at the hardware level. So I need to explain this uh, because uh, this will explain some of the uh, kind of weird things that happen when you write uh, programs. So as I said before, BlueGene, Q, and System Z, and Power8 all have a, trans a form of transactional memory. Here I'm going to talk about Intel uh, because that's the uh, because I only have time to talk about one. So under Intel TSX, this is how you write a transaction. This is uh, C code. So you start out by saying, you, the underscore X begin is a system call that says, I want to start a speculative transaction. So this is a little bit like a fork or a V fork in uh, Unix. It returns a code. And if the code that you get is this code, that means you're executing inside a transaction. If that happens, then you execute your speculative code. If you had any other code uh, being returned, that means that your transaction aborted. So it means you tried to execute your speculative code, it failed for some reason, and now you have to do something to uh, recover from uh, the tra your transaction failure. You could try it again, or you could follow an alternative. And code tends to look something like this. You start out and say, uh, you know, if the, um, you know, what, what can happen? I could call underscore x abort. I didn't like something, so I decided to abort my transaction and roll back. For example, some kind of conditional waiting. It could be that I had a synchronization conflict with someone. If that happens, I should probably retry, maybe after a, a back off. It could be, uh, it could be that I, my buffer overflowed. So I exhausted uh, some kind of a hardware limit. Uh, it's probably not a good idea to retry because it will probably happen again if, uh, that, uh, if that sort of thing happens. And uh, you know, there are all kinds of other abort codes. So let's talk about if you program using these mechanisms, what are the bad things that can happen? Well, one bad thing that can happen is your transaction might be too big. 
So if your data set overflows the caches or internal buffers, then your transaction will uh, fail. So you should use hardware transactional memory for small uh, transactions. Uh, if your transaction is too slow, then a timer interrupt may clean out your cache and your transaction uh, will abort. Uh, it turns out there's lots of other reasons why a transaction might abort. If there's an internal uh, uh, TLB miss, uh, if you execute an illegal instruction, if you get a page fault, uh, these are extremely rare, but they could uh, happen. So as a result, a common way to write, to, to make use of uh, hardware transactional memory of the Intel flavor is to take a hybrid approach where we are going to combine a transactional approach, a speculative approach with a non-transactional approach. So here, for example, is a way of uh, combining uh, uh, locks with hardware transactions. So the idea here is I'm going to start a transaction and I'm going to have a lock. I'm going to read the lock state. And once I read the lock state, that guarantees that if anybody acquires a lock, that will abort my transaction. So if the lock is taken, then I'm going to uh, roll back and maybe get the lock myself. Uh, if my transaction aborts, then I'm going to say, okay, I tried this speculatively. Maybe there's a lot of contention. I'm going to acquire the lock uh, anyway. But if I can execute the code without using a lock, then I get uh, better uh, concurrency. Uh, this is a pattern that's called lock elision and is actually supported in Intel hardware. So in Intel hardware, what you do is you, if you acquire a lock uh, with a, and you set a special code, the first time around, you, everything you do inside the critical section is done speculatively using the hardware transactional memory uh, mechanism. If it fails, then you loop around and you do it again and actually acquire the lock. So the nice thing about uh, this is that you can speed up legacy code in the sense that I can take code that was written long before hardware transactional memory was invented. I can change the uh, bit in the uh, lock acquisition uh, code by using a binary editor and I can get uh, substantial speedups in uh, many applications. Uh, notice that many times threads that acquire conflicting locks don't actually conflict because the locks are too uh, coarse grained. Okay, so I'm going to um, uh, start wrapping up by talking about one um, kind of fun application of uh, transactional memory, which, is, which I call lock teleportation. So the idea here is one common pattern in uh, data structures is what's called hand over hand locking. So imagine I'm going down a list so I can acquire a lock, release it, and I can follow this uh, uh, pattern as I go along. It gives you a limited amount of um, a concurrency. If I want to remove something, then I can acquire, I can do this using hand over hand locking. Uh, I can, <coughs> The idea here is that I can combine locks and transactional memory in uh, different uh, ways. For example, I can uh, acquire a lock and then start a transaction while I'm holding the lock. I can read through the uh, list and then somewhere down the list, what I can do is I can, uh, inside the transaction, I can release the lock, release one lock and acquire the other one. And that has the advantage that no locks were acquired in the middle. So I, I acquire one lock, start an atomic transaction, race through the uh, list, acquire the lock, acquire a second lock, release the first lock, and then commit the transaction. And to the outside, it looks like uh, the lock instantaneously moved from one end of the list to another. And so this is uh, you know, way more efficient than doing hand over hand uh, locking. It has some tricky aspects. For example, how far do I want to teleport? How far do I want to read before I transfer the locks? Uh, if, I, if it's too short, then I miss the opportunity. 
So in the limit, hand over hand locking uh, says you don't need transactions because I'm holding one lock when I acquire the other lock. If I go too far, if I overflow my buffer, for example, my hardware buffer, uh, then my transaction aborts and all the work I just did uh, doesn't uh, accomplish anything. So the trick is you want to teleport the lock just far enough. So uh, there's uh, a number of uh, things that uh, we can do here. Uh, the um, Probably the most successful strategy that I've seen is you have a limit of how far you go. Each time you're successful, you say, okay, next time I'm going to go one further. So that if you successfully teleport a lock for five steps, then the next time you try six and the next time you try seven, at some point you may overreach, at which point uh, you uh, set your limit to half of what it was and you uh, go ahead. This is uh, the kind of strategy that's used in networking all the time. So you can set uh, timeouts uh, in, this, uh, in this way. So uh, there, there's a paper that uh, describes uh, how this uh, works. It turns out that works uh, you know, uh, fairly well. And I like this example because it shows that there are many creative ways to combine different kinds of synchronization. That is, uh, for some things, uh, transactions uh, act much better than locks. For other things, locks act better than transactions. But I think there's a large space of solutions that are not completely understood where we can combine transactions and locks in uh, new and uh, creative uh, ways. So um, this pretty much concludes the technical part of the presentation. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you a very high level and brief kind of survey of open questions and uh, research questions uh, things that where we would really like to know the answers, but nobody uh, quite knows. So, as I've said, one of the areas that um, I think is still interesting is how to combine transactions and locks in effective uh, ways. Uh, I don't think of locks and transactions as being enemies in some sense. I think that they are both mechanisms that uh, solve the same kinds of problems and their strengths and weaknesses complement each other. And I'm uh, very excited about the idea of trying to understand how they can be used together to uh, make each one uh, 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 stronger. Uh, one area where transactions have turned out to be surprisingly useful is memory management. Uh, malloc free garbage collection. There are lots and lots of uh, ways in which uh, if you're doing memory management, you tend to be doing very stylized uh, kinds of operations. Uh, so the amount of work you need to do is fairly well understood. It's extremely important because programs are always allocating and freeing memory all the time. And I think uh, transactional memory uh, can, has been shown to be uh, uh, useful here, but I think there is still uh, much work to be done in understanding how to improve uh, that. Uh, databases uh, are a, um, an area where hardware transactions uh, can be useful. It's a little bit ironic because we stole the idea of atomic transactions from uh, databases, but the date classical databases have a very different idea of what a transaction is. Uh, transactional memory uh, is, turns out, it's very helpful for in-memory databases. These are databases that live in memory, not on disk. Uh, they, uh, they're good for online transaction processing, uh, web servers, Amazon, uh, Yandex, uh, those uh, kinds of uh, applications. Uh, the uh, one area that uh, <clears throat> I like which I think has uh, not received enough attention is uh, effect on energy, on uh, architecture. So with uh, some of my colleagues in engineering department, uh, we've been working on uh, trying to understand wh whether locks of transactional memory are more energy efficient. That is, uh, is your chip more likely to overheat if you're using locks than if you're using transactional memory? 
And it turns out that transactional memory uh, does seem to be much more energy efficient under most circumstances because you're doing things uh, speculatively. So the, um, there's been a lot of work on hardware accelerators. <clears throat> GPUs are the most obvious example. Uh, it turns out that GPUs uh, can use uh, hardware transactions. Again, they look a little bit different from uh, multi-core hardware transactions, but uh, there's been a lot of interest in applying uh, hardware transactions and hardware transactional technology to uh, GPUs. And uh, finally, um, things like operating systems are a big uh, area. Uh, it turns out you can simplify operating system kernels, device drivers, all kinds of things. I think there's still a lot of interesting questions in uh, this uh, particular area. Uh, there's been a lot of work on uh, data structures. If you naively design a data structure, it turns out it may not, transactions might not work very well. Uh, for example, if your hash table has a counter that is incremented by every operation, then you're not going to get much concurrency with speculative transactions because everybody's going to conflict on the counter. So there is an art to designing data structures in a way that uh, makes uh, transactions uh, work. Okay, so uh, in some sense, oh, and of course, there's a lot of computer architecture work that uh, can be done since this, in some sense, transaction memory originated in computer architecture and um, even though it's uh, visible mostly in software. Okay, so there's a uh, something called the uh, hype curve, which says that every new idea starts out from somewhere. It appears and people say, oh, this is wonderful. This is going to solve everything. That's the top first uh, bump. Then they say, oh, wait a second. There are all kinds of new complications and new uh, kinds of uh, problems. Uh, maybe this is no good. And then eventually people learn how to solve the problems and uh, things uh, become uh, normal. This kind of curve is followed by every technical innovation you can imagine, including uh, you know, garbage collection, uh, virtual memory, and so on. And I think we're getting to the point where transactions are becoming uh, normal. But it's clear that transactions in some sense are here to stay. Uh, there's support for transactional constructs in C++ in other languages, you know, Haskell uh, and so on. Uh, they're, um, they've been introduced into uh, Intel architectures and uh, they are obviously never going to uh, go away. So transactions are here to stay and what we need is a way to figure out how to use them better. So in the time left, I'd be happy to take any questions. Right. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful talk. I hope, uh, well, I'm sure that we uh, began more wider and smarter. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, uh, a lot of questions from the audience, but uh, thank goodness you have me and I have a bunch of questions, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, the first of all, you, uh, in your code uh, about uh, transactionals, where we uh, uh, try to one transaction and then if it fails we go to the logs uh how how could we protect our transaction from the fact that someone uh already tried uh transaction and failed to the logs uh, uh so uh logs uh, uh should should be able to somehow check that someone in in inside transaction already right ah uh, so, so so that's a um um a good technical problem because the Intel architecture, a transaction can see whether a lock is held, but there is no way for a, a non-transactional thread to see whether a transaction is in progress. Now the power architecture does uh, give you a way to, uh, to solve that uh, problem, but Intel uh, doesn't. So there, there is a kind of asymmetry where if you, wait, you start these programs and everybody runs transactionally and you get a lot of concurrency, then if somebody acquires a lock, that, that's going to abort all the speculative transactions. Everyone switches to locking and it's harder to switch back. You typically need some kind of a fallback mechanism or some kind of uh, hints. 
But if I were uh, in charge of designing the next generation of Intel architecture, I would insist on putting in some way for a thread operating inside a transaction to set a bit somewhere saying, please don't acquire this lock right now, I'm running a transaction. But uh, this, is, this is, I think, one of the uh, challenges in uh, designing these kinds of hybrid locks under Intel architecture. Under the, you know, the IBM power architecture, there is a way to, uh, to get around this. Ah, okay. But the, uh, in this day, it sounds, it sounds like uh, it's a big challenge to use transaction because you have to, I don't know, verify or after every operation that uh, did someone uh, step in and uh, start to use logs? Or, or well, the, the, like the way the transaction works is you will be notified. You will start your transaction ah. and then uh, if there is, if you, once you read the lock, if anybody writes it, then you will instantly uh, go back to uh, the uh, begin, to the X begin call, and you will return from it with a code saying, sorry, your transaction aborted, and now you need to uh, execute your plan B, your, your second uh, uh, strategy. Uh, okay, got it. Got it. So basically, once uh, someone step into the logs, we abort every transaction and... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that, 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 the, the logs. The, the hardware will will abort every other uh, transaction, so so there's no question of safety, but there is a question of uh, how do you um, how, how do you convince everyone to go back and uh, execute speculatively. Uh -huh. Okay, got it. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, another another question. Uh, do you know uh, you mentioned the software uh, software transaction, uh, but unfortunately, I don't see. Um, a lot of usage of that uh, technique uh, in practice. Uh, do you think that's uh, because we too get used to logs or uh, because uh, uh, performance? Any comments? So, so, so purely software transactions are, uh, people were very excited about them at first because uh, it's, they're very attractive from a software engineering point of view. The problem was always a performance that uh, purely software transactions uh, tended to be slower than uh, locks. Originally, they were much slower. Now, they perform much better than they did because we know much more about how to structure these systems. But it's still the case that uh, they don't perform as well as people would uh, like. Uh, this is why I think that hybrid uh, systems that combine hardware and software are promising. The hardware is maybe too low level for many people to use. The software is high level, but uh, slow. Uh, I think the combination of the two is the most uh, promising uh, way uh, forward. But languages like Haskell have used uh, uh, software transactions uh, very uh, effectively. Oh, right. So everyone uh, has to... Uh start writing in Haskell. <laughs> and, well, that's, uh, that's a uh, little bit of, that's, that's, that's a radical, uh, you know, you know, I'm, I actually like the Haskell, but I would hesitate uh, recommending it to my friends. Ah, okay. <laughs> Okay. And uh, Ruslan is asking, Professor uh, Morley Henley here, you mentioned OS use case. Do you see specific benefits that can be uh, at, uh, attained by uh, hardware transaction memory if, let us uh, say, the Linux kernel will adopt uh, with uh, widely? I, I, I think they... Um... It, it does require careful engineering, as you know, as any powerful technique does. But I think that uh, the Linux kernel is exactly the kind of application that uh, could uh, benefit from uh, hardware transactional memory because people understand how large and how long the critical sections are. Uh, there are a lot of uh, locks that are acquired pessimistically. So just because my thread and your thread acquire the same lock does not necessarily mean we have a conflict. And so the ability to execute speculatively usually will give you an improvement. If there is a real conflict all the time, then it doesn't matter what kind of synchronization you use, you're going to have a problem. 
But in the normal case where actual conflicts are rare, then I think uh, hardware transaction memory is very uh, promising. I got it. And uh, I think our time is uh, ending right now. And uh, Alexi, uh, well, I, I have... Uh, I have actually uh, one one mention about uh, the transactional. Uh, we we have that optimistic logs, uh, but unfortunately, yeah, I haven't seen a lot of usage uh, in my practice as well. So, um, Alexei, yeah, uh, no, I... yeah, we have we have uh, you know a minute, about a minute, so we can ah, yeah. Okay, yeah, Morris, could you comment uh, that optimistic? Oh, oh, oh I, I'm a big fan of optimistic um, uh, approaches. You know, there's a saying that it's always better to apologize uh, than to ask uh, permission. So, uh, you know, hardware <laughs> optimism in hardware, optimism in uh, software. You know, I think that uh, this is it's always um, best to try to do things optimistically rather than uh, pessimistically. Okay, got it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ivan, and thank you very much, Maurice. I think that was a very interesting talk. And uh, all the attendees, please uh, push the Zoom button below. Oh, yeah, the time is over. <laughs> yeah, so all mm -hmm. the attendees, please push the Zoom button under the web player and go uh, to Zoom discussion room together with Ivan and Morris. Morris, thank you very, very much for your talk. And Ivan, thank you very much for your support. Why, thank you. I, I hope. I hope everyone uh, uh, in home should uh, uh, give us applause. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Good. Thank you very much. It's a Thanks. great honor for us, Maurice, to have you on board the previous year and this year and three years ago. And we are like, uh, it's a, uh, I think it's a very good opportunity for all the attendees to like see you during the cross, using the cross Atlantic way, you know. <laughs> thank I, you very I, much. Again, I, I, w I wish I could be there in person. Yeah, we'll have to and hope to see you maybe uh, the next year in Moscow, probably. So we should have, uh, so we, we hope, we hope that we have small chances to have mm -hmm. uh, offline this year. And uh, if the COVID situation will be better, we, uh, we hope to, to like to use this, ch this small chance or not small, who knows. Uh, who thank knows? you very much. This is distributed okay. stream from three parts from uh, uh, Ivan, Morris, and our local office, and it works. That's good news. Distribution systems really work, Morris. Good news. <laughs> <laughs> have a good have a good discussion zone. And okay. You.